navy blue cap flattened. I remember scraping blood from its silver badge. That day they came with his watch, his cap, his baton, his whistle, his bloody relics. The rest lay plastered cold, in neat patches bullet hold, freshly laid for the family to kiss and a parade. Since the 1960s, a nasty, brutal and violent parallel universe has evolved in Ireland. It's an underworld where all devices are satisfied at a terrible price. Where power is seized by force, maintained through fear and lost to the assassin's bullet. Here life is cheap and the wages of sin are irresistibly tempting. This is the dark world of gangland. Its grip has demoralized neighborhoods and destroyed many lives. This is the world of organized crime, where no holes are barred, everything is fair game, and the spoils go to the most ruthless. Welcome to Badfellas. The bodies of the two latest victims of the country's gangland and gun culture were this afternoon removed from the house at Scribblestown Park in Finglas, where they were brutally murdered this morning. Most of those who feel vulnerable and insecure are ordinary law-abiding citizens, people doing their best to make a go of life. They are the ones who suffer first and the most at the hands of organized crime. Martin Marlowe Highland one of the biggest, if not the biggest, drug dealer in the country was the gunman's target. But 20-year-old Anthony Campbell was also shot dead, a young man doing an honest day's work. I remember when they released his body and his hand, he obviously put his hand up to protect himself so he knew. Do you know what I mean? And that's always going to live with me. What was his last moments like, how frightened he was? You know, that's something I live with daily. To have your child murdered is just... I can't even explain it because the pain is that great. I don't think anyone can understand it until it's happened to you. Mm -hmm. The double murders of gang boss Marlo Highland and innocent plumber Anthony Campbell sticks out in people's minds. But nearly 200 others have been gunned down in gangland hits since the year 2000. Badfellas will tell the story of how organized crime took root in Ireland since the 1960s. It's a story of how guns and narcotics arrived on the streets and changed the face of Irish society. It is a story without an end in sight. Proportionately speaking, about five times as many gun killings occur in Ireland than do in comparable countries such as England and Wales or in Scotland. So there is legitimate concern about the levels of, of gun killings in Ireland. It's very simple. Uh, people get into organised crime because big money to be made. Some people get in at the small end and suddenly it just grows and grows and the next thing they are high up in the pyramid and they're subject to the disciplines and to the to threats of death and the possibility of actually being murdered because they have lost money or lost a shipment or even just pure suspicion that they're talking to somebody. Drugs underlie so much of the murder and mayhem that we have on the streets, the high level of murders. It has to do with internecine gang rivalries, uh, falling out with one another, double-crossing one another, stealing one another's shipments and loads of drugs. It's hard to find a murder that actually wouldn't be attributable to drugs in some way. I would say number one priority is organised crime because it's such a blight and a cancer on our society. And if it's not checked, uh, it'll spread throughout the country. It's like any cancer, it'll grow and grow and grow. Organised crime is big business in Ireland. According to the Health Research Board, the drugs trade alone is worth 5 million euro a day. That's 1.8 billion euro every year. Earlier this year, the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime described organised crime globally as the new superpower. For example, heroin into Europe alone was about 20 billion and counterfeiting into Europe was about 10 billion. 
Irish organised crime is just part of a vast, shadowy global enterprise. In America, the underworld's colossal financial clout has long been seen as a sinister force to be reckoned with. In the mid-90s, the former president, Bill Clinton, referred to it as a clear and present danger to the national security of the United States, and that has only developed further and has gotten worse. Just one group, La Cosa Nostra, in the United States alone was estimated to make over $100 billion in one year from illegal gambling. When you consider the other groups that are involved, Russian organized crime groups, Irish organized crime, Asian and Balkan groups, then you consider the other criminal activities, drug trafficking, prostitution, counterfeiting, and cyber crimes. The numbers are astronomical. The level of organized crime in Ireland has become so serious that in cities like Limerick, the wealth, power and fear generated by warring crime gangs has threatened and undermined the commercial and social cohesion of the city. There is a pervasive feeling that even if you mind your own business, you're not safe. And if you do stand up for your civil rights, be prepared to pay a very high price. Roy Collins' family ran a number of pubs in Limerick City. The victim was shot after two gunmen entered the amusement arcade which adjoins the Steering Wheel pub in Roxburgh shopping centre shortly after noon. The victim's family had been subjected to gangland violence in the past. The first cousin of Mr Collins's was threatened and shot in one of their pubs in December 2004 after he refused entry to a 14-year-old girl. Wayne Dundon, a member of the McCarthy Dundon faction, heavily involved in Limerick's feud, was subsequently jailed for 10 years for threatening the man, but no one has been convicted for the shooting. We gave evidence like to, to put the leading member of the McCarthy Dundon gang away, and that wasn't going to be left go. I thought it was, I thought it kind of got it, but we were wrong. Like, uh, they, they wanted to get back at us for that, like, and that's what happened. Life as we know it is non existent now. Being followed by Gardaí everywhere you go, you can't socialize. We'll have a, a sentence for the rest of our life uh, of looking over our shoulders, of being protected by Gardaí, and it's no life, really. The murder of law-abiding citizens by crime gangs to deter witnesses and scare juries has eroded many people's faith in the capacity of the Irish state to protect their freedoms and civil liberties. These people are just making life hell for decent, ordinary people in particular geographic areas of the country. People, if they think that it's going to stay in Limerick and stay in certain parts of Dublin and not extend out into the rest of the country, they're being incredibly naive. To tell the story of how and why organised crime took hold in Ireland, we must go back to the 1960s. Although no one realised it at the time, it was the twilight of an age of superficial innocence. A safe, secure, stable society, almost crime-free, where bicycles went unlocked and hall doors were left open. The guards are an impressive force, big men, suggesting bogland scenes in the centre of gas and petrol fumes, suggesting also comfort and stability. You had a baton, a whistle, and um, perhaps a torch. There were very few patrol cars. There was one patrol car in the Store Street district, and there was one plainclothes car for detectives. You had closely knit communities where the same families knew one another for generations, and where they could put pressure on younger people to behave themselves. And I'm sure the church, who gets blamed for so many things, probably uh, would claim some credit uh, for the way things were. When I arrived from Templemore in the Dublin city in 1965, it was a pretty stable conservative society. Serious crime was virtually unheard of. A certain amount of violence, uh, bad rows outside pubs, that type of thing. Some people carried knives. Guns were most unusual. In 1966, there were only four murders in Ireland. None of them involved guns. There were break-ins into shops, larcenies from various types of warehouses and stores and 
There was some pickpocketing and bicycle thefts, and that was the main type of crime that um, occurred. Well, I practiced law in, in Limerick throughout the 60s. There was uh, really very little crime at all, and I can recall that at the start of circuit court sittings, the county registrar would stand up and uh, he'd present the judge with a pair of white gloves. And that was to signify that there was no indictable crime in the city or county of Limerick. And that used to go on term after term. I don't think there'd have been white gloves in Limerick uh, <laughs> in, <laughs> in the 80s, 90s, the noughties, or that there ever will be again. Dublin once had many gunsmiths. Today, rods and guns can be bought in many places, but in the early part of the century, they were sold by specialists after long consultation. Gun crime was very rare in Ireland in the 1960s, and not only was it very rare, the types of gun crime that occurred were very different to the, the types of offences that happen today. The offences that occurred in the 1960s usually involved parties that were known to each other, and usually it was some kind of strife, perhaps over a domestic incident or over, over land. But we're talking about crime figures in single figures in the 1960s. From the mid-1960s, petty crime in Ireland was on the rise the country was changing. The ties that bonded communities together began to slowly unravel, but serious crime was still a rarity. In the mid-60s, there were 300 prisoners in Irish jails. Today, there are over 4,000. 1966 is a good year to use as a starting point because it's the 50th anniversary of the 1916 uh, rising, and Irish society had, by that time, I think, matured and settled down. In fact, the society had become so relatively safe and crime-free that there was discussion, real debate, serious debate, about whether or not we should close down some prisons. So you can take it almost as the last point of, of normality, because three years later, of course, you had the outbreak of violence in the north of Ireland. The 60s was an era of ferment. The Vietnam War and the American civil rights struggle radicalized a generation of students across the world. This turmoil spawned urban guerrilla groups committed to armed revolt. The Bader Meinhof Gang, the Weather Underground, the Red Brigades, all believe power came from the barrel of a gun. In Ireland, these currents created a faction called Sayre Era. Sayre Era would change the face of crime in Ireland by bringing in the gun. What you had was an organization which comprised with some ex-IRA people, some you describe as, as revolutionaries, some as could be described as anarchists, who formed this organization called Sayreira. There were paramilitaries, they were subversive, they robbed banks, apparently they kept some money for themselves. They put a lot of planning into their operations and uh, they were very volatile, very violent. Sarah Era claimed they wanted to ignite a socialist revolution by attacking the establishment. This would be achieved by robbing banks and using the proceeds to somehow encourage workers and small farmers to overthrow the government and capitalism in Ireland. The point at which you begin to see uh, the gun emerging in society down here is when it became used in armed raids. And if you're the self-professed socialists, which many of them were, uh, they had the added incentive of saying they were taking it from the capitalist, capitalist system or from the financial institutions of the capitalist system. So well, all that was good. Almost two years before the outbreak of the Troubles, Sayre Era struck their first blow for a socialist republic in Drumcondra on Dublin's north side. The date was February the 27th, 1967. The occasion was the first armed robbery of a bank since World War II. That day, Sayre Era gunmen entered these premises and stole £3,265. In today's money, that was worth over €100,000. A tidy sum to start a revolution. A year later in Ballyfermot, these so-called revolutionaries also revealed that they were reckless. 
When spotted by a squad car on the way to a raid, they opened up on the unarmed policemen pursuing them. We spotted a stolen car with four men in it outside the bank. They were about to rob the bank. A chase ensued. One of the raiders uh, put his head and shoulders out one of the back windows of the car and he fired a number of shots directly at the patrol car. We dived down in the car and actually the driver had nowhere to dive. He had to keep down as best he could and he swerved the car from left to right to avoid the gunfire. The leading lights of this faction are forgotten now. Men like Sean Doyle, Martin Casey, Paddy Dillon and Frank Keane. They were supposed to be political now. I'd put that in inverted commas, like lots of robberies that were carried out after that. Every robbery that was happened through the 70s and 80s, there'd be one of the gang trying to speak with an order accent and claiming it was political. Sarah was connected to Dublin's emerging underworld. Among their membership was a man who would in time become the godfather of Ireland's first major organised crime gang, the Duns. That man was a charismatic character called Christy Branco Dunn, the eldest of 22 children from Crumlin in Dublin. It was this career criminal who used his English gangland contacts to provide Sarera with some of its arsenal of guns. The weapons were stolen from a firearms factory in Birmingham. Branco was to blaze a trail that other gangsters would soon follow. First time that he came to Ramans as being a political figure, was after there was a man named Walsh blown up on the railway line. He was a member of Sierra Era, uh, up near the Phoenix Park. And Christie made a bit of a speech at the GPO and, and fired a shot, if you don't mind. And then he was obviously accepted in as a, as a member of Sierra Era. And he was convicted in the district court, I think he got six months. He assaulted the judge at the time. So he was really making himself a, a figure, a leading figure in Sarera at that time. In February 1970, here in this town in Rathdrum, they took over this town, set up roadblocks, cut phone lines, fired shots over the Garda, and robbed the bank of £1,500. Now, this was a, an audacious, reckless operation. And it set minds thinking as to what this organisation would do next. If it was a question that the forces of oppression did attempt to disarm or did attack a unit of Syria in operation, Syria would resist, has resisted, and will resist again. These misfits are rarely mentioned in the story of organised crime in Ireland. Yet it was Sir Era who first brought the gun back onto the streets of Irish towns and terrified ordinary people working and doing business in banks and post offices. On April the 3rd, 1970, four Sarah Era volunteers set out to rob the branch of the Allied Irish Bank on Arran Key in Dublin. This operation would be a defining moment in the history of serious crime in Ireland. The spate of raids on banks had led to heightened security. Banks now had alarms and the police were on alert. Garda Richard Fallon was on his way to work when Sarah Era entered a bank and stole £2,000. It had been the usual morning, you know, he got up and shaved as usual. There was the bit of polishing of the buckles on his tunic as they always did in those days with the older uniform. So he went out the door as usual that morning with a quick goodbye. Richard Fallon, he was a senior guard in Montjoy when I arrived there. He mentored younger personnel and he told anybody, the whole unit that were there, that um, people should be careful on the street and that um, in his case, that a Scott Medal awarded posthumously wouldn't be any good to his widow, which was, you know, prophetic. The Raiders, there were four of them, entered the bank shortly before 11 o'clock. Once inside, they pulled masks over their heads, drew guns and ordered the four customers and 13 staff members to lie on the floor. But the manager of the bank, Mr. Stanley Keegan, spotted them from his office. He pressed a buzzer which rang an alarm in Dublin Castle and the Bridewell, so that when the raiders came out of the bank, a squad car pulled up outside. This is the first time in my life I've ever walked down this lane. It's the lane that leads to the bank where my father was killed on the 3rd of April, 1970. He'd gone to collect his car from being serviced 
but they got the call in the squad car while he was being given a lift down and he ended up here coming in the front gate of the bank right as the raiders came out the front door i heard shots which were fired either just at the door or outside the door the raiders were storming out the door it's recounted that he raised his arm and uh, was shot in the arm at that point i then saw a policeman chasing somebody along the lane here and uh, i heard a further shot and uh, i saw the policeman fall fatal shot was delivered to him here he died instantly on that spot there and the guard who was with him paul firth said an act of contrition into his ear That sent shockwaves through everybody on the island of Ireland, I would say, at that particular time. A relatively small group of people terrorizing different towns in the state with their activity in terms of robbing banks. And in essence here, shooting down an unarmed member of the Garda Síochána carrying out his duty. We had really crossed the Rubicon because now we are into the era of the gun. This was unbelievable that a, a member, an unarmed member of the Garda Shikana would be shot dead in cold blood. And it really was the end of the age of innocence as far as policing and armed robberies and organized crime is concerned. When all the public eye was taken away from us, we were like all families in a, in a brief situation. You're on your own. And I remember going upstairs one day at that point and opening a cupboard on the landing. And uh, some of my father's shoes were in the bottom. And I remember stepping into them, just trying to remember how big his feet were. And uh, I, I could feel the imprints of his toes in the bottom of the shoe. And it kind of gave me a shiver, and, you know, and it was a sense that, yeah, they've taken him away from us. Uh, Dad isn't there anymore. Once you introduce the gun into society, the guy with the gun now becomes the most powerful guy. And the guy with the gun doesn't abide by any conventional or civilized rules. He makes his own rules. I think the fact that there was so much subversive crime, and because the subversive crime turned to things like bank robberies and, and so on, and the enrichment of those who were involved in it, uh, it uh, began to generate the feeling in uh, the minds of other non-subversive people uh, that they might as well take the benefit of it too. Ordinary crime then began to develop, if you like, in parallel uh, with the subversive activities. Re-enter Christy Dunn and his crime family of eight brothers. This group would help nurture, sponsor, induct, recruit, and train several individuals who would become major international crime figures over the next 30 years. Martin Cahill, the general. John Cunningham, the colonel. George Mitchell, the penguin. John Gilligan, the warehouse man. They and other outlaws all started their careers on heists, strokes, and raids initiated by the Duns. I would have to take the responsibility for introducing serious crime into the family only because I felt with my brothers that if we ever did do anything together, which we have done, that uh, it was a close-kept secret between us. We worked together, we could depend on each other with our lives, and we knew that uh, whatever we did, nobody else would ever know about it. Larry and Vianney and Shamey and Christy, they all were into robberies and they accumulated money through robberies, mainly jewellery robberies or cash or whatever they could get their hands on. Now, there'd be big jobs to be done. They wouldn't be doing small hold-ups. They were very violent. They, they certainly were into the upper echelons of crime, serious crime. 
Their father, Christie Sr., was a bad fella in his own heyday. Old Bronco was an ex-con who had served prison time for killing a man. He was proud of his sons. Were you aware that your sons were robbing banks? I was, yes. Yes. And I quite admired them for... You admired them for robbing the banks? Yes. Why? As long as nobody was hurt. Why? Well, am I getting money the, the handy way? No loss of life, no malicious damage or injuries to anybody. But they're taking somebody else's money. Yes, but who do you know whose money it is that's in the bank? How do them people get it? In time, the Duns would become the scourge of Irish society. By 1970, Christie, the eldest and the original self-appointed criminal godfather, had already earned his place in history for his involvement with the short-lived Sayre era. The revolutionaries who had fired the shots that marked the death knell of a way of life. From 1970 on, armed robbery, extortion, abductions, tiger kidnappings and murder would become commonplace. The chaotic 70s would create Ireland's first generation of criminal godfathers as crime gangs sought to imitate the paramilitaries. The state, distracted by divisions from within and attacks from without, failed to notice the looming menace of organised crime. The era of the badfellas was upon us. Organised crime did not exist in the Ireland of the 1960s, but the troubles would change all that. Serious crime would become a daily event as Republican paramilitaries raised funds for their war. The rise of the bad fellas starts here. The spillover of the Northern Ireland troubles would rock the Irish Republic to its foundations. Ironically, it was members of the cabinet who stood accused of assisting the emergence of a guerrilla army. This was the scene outside the Dublin District Court today as the two former ministers were charged. Just weeks after the murder of Garda Richard Fallon, Charles Hawhey, the finance minister, and Neil Blaney, the agriculture minister, were dismissed from office. Taoiseach Jack Lynch believed they were implicated in a covert plot to split the IRA and provide arms to what would become known as the Provisionals. In the years to come, the Provisional IRA would send crime rates off the charts. For the new justice minister, Des O'Malley, it was a baptism of fire. It was a very serious threat indeed to the very integrity of the state. While there always had been a tradition of subversion against the state, what was different in 1969 and 70 was subversion uh, within the state, within the very government that was there to represent and protect the state and its citizens. That made it so much more sinister. The arms crisis is the great defining moment, I think, in contemporary Irish politics. You were suddenly into a completely abnormal set of circumstances. From that moment on, everything was different. Different world. In the 70s, the story of crime in Ireland is mainly the story of terrorist crime. The organisations committed to political revolution were on the warpath. Nothing and nobody was safe and every source of potential revenue for the cause was fair game. People nowadays talk about the IRA as if it were a single sort of unit, but I, I was at that time actually faced with three uh, violent organisations because there was the official IRA, the provisional IRA and Serera. It was a fairly frightening scenario at the time in the early 70s. Armed robberies exploded. In 1968, there were only three armed robberies in the Republic. By 1972, that had risen to 123. Ireland was engulfed in a revolutionary crime wave. Bank robberies, post office robberies, all type of robberies became commonplace for the sole purpose of funding these particular organisations. And it's important to, to, to understand that during the 60s, you would have been dealing with four or five robberies. That is, the Garda Chicana would have been dealing with four or five robberies in the year. It increased then and it evolved into maybe 100, 150 armed robberies in the year. 95% of which I would believe at that time were carried out by paramilitary organisations, the official IRA, the provisional IRA. 
being in justice in the early 70s was like uh, being in charge of a fire brigade. You were running around all the time trying to put out fires. Uh, and uh, you could do very little constructive work. And all of these things, uh, these uh, extreme acts of violence and so on, and were all happening for the first time. And it meant that you had to concentrate all your efforts on that. I would say, and I, I say with absolute certainty, that the vast majority of the Irish people will not tolerate the IRA and want the strongest possible action to be taken against them. The priorities at that time changed over those few years from countering housebreakings and, and unauthorized takings to countering armed robberies, uh, gun crime and uh, paramilitary violence. This is Rossborough House near Blessington, County Wicklow, scene of what is now generally accepted as the world's greatest art robbery. An armed gang raided the stately home of Sir Alfred and Lady Bight. Nineteen rare paintings valued around eight million pounds were cut from their frames and held for ransom. Most crimes of a serious nature, in terms of extortion, in terms of bank robberies, were carried out by paramilitary groups. And in essence, they could be described more as organized crime. And it is fair to say, uh, to all concerned, that the activities of criminals would not have been the number one priority. Hey, what the hell are you? While the cops were sidetracked by the political mayhem of the 1970s, those involved in crime as a way of life were watching and waiting for an opportunity to make it big. John, there's good pickings if you know where to look. Me and Johnny, we know it's a good place. That's a cinch to knock off. Never been done before either. I'm thinking of having a look at it tonight. A week in the life of Martin Cluxton depicted the type of crime that was occurring and the type of person that was attracted to crime. Are you mad? Any trouble around here and I'm the first to be lured off the Star Street. Many of them were poor, from large families, badly educated and easily led. I'll keep them talking at the front. Johnny does the back office where the cash is. Be easier with three though. Many of them were young delinquents who had spent time in the brutal industrial schools. We're neither qualified nor equipped to deal with the work of rehabilitation. The end result is that most of the boys leave with this relatively the same attitudes to and aggressions against society as when they arrived. Amongst the ranks of the army of children that passed through the industrial schools was the future leaders of organized crime in Ireland. Christy Dunn and his brothers, Martin Cahill and his associates, John Cunningham and his crew. They all spent a lifetime hitting back. I'm not a godfather, I'm a good father. I think it was convenient for the authorities and the police in particular to have a family like the Duns, who I regard as just scapegoats. A lot of my family, my sisters and my brothers live in substandard accommodation that's been given to them by the corporation. The corporation have made it quite clear that under no circumstances will the Duns ever be housed in anything other than substandard accommodation. I feel that my family, like most other unfortunate people living in these areas, become victims. Dublin Corporation working class housing has changed very little in the last 40 years. You're dealing with people all of the same class. It's much easier to treat them like an army, to transplant them from A to B. They have very little choice in the matter. If a child is to improve, it will be in spite of the environment. Of course, um, uh, crime and criminals come from deprivation, lack of opportunity, lack of education. But in the very same localities, other families uh, do well and prosper and never get into trouble of any description. So there must be some responsibility on the individual. Criminals that I would be familiar with in the city would fall into different categories. There would be those who initially did it out of need. Perhaps family conditions, family circumstances were not good, families were dysfunctional. They had nobody to show them the way. 
and there are those who are career criminals in it for the making of money. Generally what appears to be the case is that when legitimate avenues have been cut off that some individuals maybe because of economic or maybe even personality reasons will turn to organized crime because in a business sense it makes sense to commit such crimes. My research indicates that that's not enough to explain serious crime and in particular gun crime that there are rational factors at play but that there are also social factors and oftentimes personality factors also. I think the criminals that progressed in the area of crime, such as Martin Cattle and his gang, or the Duns and, and uh, the people that they were associated with, they simply um, upped the ante in relation to their activities, and it was the times that were in it that allowed them to change. Certainly, the Northern situation would have given them a, a different perspective and perhaps a greater incentive to become involved in armed crime. In the early 1970s, these career criminals still enjoyed an open season and hadn't come into the frame yet. In 1973, the political upheaval that had convulsed the state resulted in a change of government. There are now 70,000 people unemployed. 70,000 people, despite the grants that are available, despite the opportunities of better markets in the EEC, and so on, there are still 70,000 unemployed. The National Coalition of Fine Gael and Labour aspired to improve social conditions and promote a fair deal for all. But those ambitions didn't survive for long in the teeth of a renewed IRA campaign. The activities of criminals like the Dunn Academy was never going to be high on the list of priorities for a government under siege. Major crimes in those days, and that would include armed robberies and kidnappings, my recollection is that they were exclusively carried out by the Provisional IRA and that the Cahills and the other major gang figures had not yet emerged. But they were obviously on the sidelines taking note. The IRA actually became the predominant issue. And it got to the point where I would say that it would have occupied half of our time on a day-by-day -day basis. We have to decide what the priorities are and to, to, to tackle these as we see them. The IRA at that point referred to us all as quislings and traitors. Uh, and at a point in this government, every member of the cabinet was under threat of assassination. By 1974, lawlessness was rampant across the island. The troubles had claimed hundreds of lives. Murder was now a way of life. There's a man lying, his two legs were mutilated. His side of his head was literally cut off. There was a young baby. She was like a rag doll. She was all torn to pieces. On the streets of Monaghan and Dublin, a UVF bombing atrocity would take over 30 lives. In this highly charged atmosphere, organized crime was not on the agenda. In Monaghan in March 1974, an IRA outrage would reinforce the sense of siege felt by every member of the government. 35-year-old Senator Billy Fox was a member of Fine Gael and a government supporter. A Monaghan Protestant, he lived on the front line. I have very happy memories of uh, Billy Fox. He was only 35 years of age at the time, and he had a future in politics. He was bright, he was articulate, he was personable. He had all the things going that politicians are supposed to need. This was the Coulson homestead near Clones. Marjorie Coulson was to be married to Billy Fox. One night in March 1974, 13 IRA volunteers came here on an operation. Senator Fox came to visit his girlfriend Marjorie Coulson as he had been doing fairly regularly. But at the time he arrived, about 10 o'clock last night, the house was being raided by a party of armed and masked men who said they were looking for arms. When he arrived, it was a raid in progress by neighbours, I'm sorry to have to say. The raid involved setting the house on fire, burning family Bibles, a totally sectarian outrage. So Billy Wright got out of his car, decided he, for whatever reason, he decided to get away. He got past the first terrorist and was running, running down the field to get away, run behind the house, when he was shot by another terrorist who was obviously on guard down there. The following morning, search was mounted. 
and his body was found lying near, near a train in a field quite a short distance away from the house. He didn't die immediately. He crawled some distance and obviously wasn't able to crawl to safety. And uh, clearly he died a, a lonely and painful and cruel death. That in itself sent shockwaves through the country and particularly through government that this organization could callously kill a member of the Oireachtas. The priority had to be countering paramilitary crime. They were the biggest threat. That's the first political murder uh, since 1927, when Kevin O'Higgins was assassinated. So the murder of a member of the Oireachtas can't be more serious. What you'd have to say is that at certain points we teetered very close to anarchy. It's inconceivable that the people who murdered him didn't know who he was. They were neighbours, they were residents of this locality, quite close to his uh, local place. So I'm quite satisfied that they knew who he was and killed him, notwithstanding his position, his status as a member of the nation's parliament. The killing of Billy Fox, just like the gunning down of Garda Fallon, is forgotten now. The senator's assassination was then just one of many murders the government had to deal with. In the shadow of the shadow of the gunmen, the criminals were busy robbing banks, stealing jewellery and breaking into factories for merchandise to sell on. Christy Dunn had long abandoned revolution and was back doing what he did best, robbing for personal gain. In 1975, Christy Dunn showed he had learned a trick or two from the IRA when he added tiger kidnapping to his repertoire. In February of that year, he led a gang that kept captive the family of the manager of West Jewelers on Grafton Street at their Booterstown home. Later, Dunn forced the manager, Robert Halpin, to open the safe in West's and made off with £70,000 worth of precious stones. This was just one of the 153 armed robberies carried out in 1975. It was no coincidence that armed robberies escalated in the, the Republic. And this, I suppose, was not divorced from what was happening in Northern Ireland with the various paramilitaries and the awful, awful violence that was happening there. In any caper that involved big money and lots of manpower, there was a good chance the Duns weren't far away. Well, they were a very active criminal family, and they were into big robberies, like jewellery robberies. They certainly were into serious crime and greed and money, and that drives all serious crime. It's all about money. By 1977, one of the brightest students from the Dunn Crime Academy was beginning to make waves in his own right. Martin Cahill hit the headlines with a raid on the Semper Tire Factory in Ballyfermot in Dublin. The heist would bear the hallmarks of all the general's strokes, precision, planning and violence. In order to hit the security van the moment it arrived with the payroll for 1,000 workers, Cahill first abducted the O'Neill family. And I said I was upstairs and told if, if any of us went to the window that we'd be sure we would just keep quiet. So we stayed there. The general held the O'Neills at gunpoint overnight. Next morning, his gang cut through the factory perimeter fence at the bottom of their garden, just as the wages van arrived. The five of them that was saying had guns. One of them stayed with me and the missus, and he was giving instructions from the back room window over. He had a walkie-talkie. When the, the van pulled up, you heard your man roll, get him now, so there was two shots ring out. Cahill's five-man gang opened fire with their weapons and shot a security guard. They escaped on motorcycles with £53,000 in cash. Organised crime was now becoming a force to be reckoned with. Crime of its, of its nature, in order to succeed, has to become organised. It has to organise itself as a business. And I think the Gardaí didn't react rapidly enough to this new phenomenon of criminals organising themselves. Now you create an alternative lifestyle. And of course there's a high degree of attraction for somebody who comes from a background of low income, suddenly seeing the potential to gain a very high standard of living. 
In 1978, the Duns carried out a heist in Rusgray County Tipperary. This was to be a decisive turning point in the story of organised crime in Ireland. Antigen is something of a modern miracle. It's in the middle of Ireland, far from air and seaports, about the last place in the world at which you think of setting up a pharmaceuticals industry. In July 1978, Christy, Shamey and Henry Dunn raided this factory and made off with £300,000 worth of the painkiller Palfium. Christy and Shamey were unaware of the potential value of the haul, but their brother Henry was. Henry paid his brothers £3,000 for their share and sold the painkiller for a massive markup on the black market. The pennies suddenly dropped for Shamey, Mickey, Boyo and Larry. Drugs was the way to go. This was to be a seminal moment in the history of organised crime in Ireland. Obviously they made money and they had a look around and said, well, there's drugs, there's a market for drugs here in this country and let's get into this. There's money, we'll invest so much money, we'll bring in drugs, we'll quadruple our, our profit and that's drove it. And you don't have to tell me about uh, the appalling social consequences of the introduction of drugs into this country, what they have been. It's been highly corrosive in terms of solidarity uh, amongst particularly amongst working class communities, which would have been very cohesive. Even societies that, where they'd been taken out of the middle of the city and then planked, I think wrongly, by the corporation out in Ballyfermot and Cabra and Crumlin and Kimmage and Finglas or wherever, they were very cohesive societies in which people quite literally did help each other. But that has been, I think, uh, the greatest casualty uh, of what has happened. Heroin would be the grim reaper of the 1980s, but the big story of the 1970s was the story of a sustained attack against the state. The first shots were fired by Ser Era, but the main assault came from the IRA. The offensive forced successive governments to meet fire with fire and take their eye off the looming menace of organized crime. I don't think that it, it overstates it to say that in part, at least, uh, the uh, present criminal situation is a legacy uh, of uh, the terrorist violence uh, that arose in uh, the early 70s. I think it gave an example to a lot of others that uh, uh, they could act in a ruthless and vicious fashion and hope to get away with it. Organised crime, as we know today, hadn't then emerged except, and significantly except, in the ranks of the provost, because the cult of organized crime and the cult of the gun began in those times with the provost, spilled over into gangland in the cities, uh, Limerick, Dublin, and lesser extent Cork. And I think one can say without fear of contradiction that the appalling crime situation that we have today can, can be linked quite clearly back to the provost and their campaign of the 70s and 80s. We would not have had a descent into organized crime to the extent that we have unfortunately suffered from. And to me, it is inescapable that the direct causal link is the IRA and the introduction of the gun and the introduction of the bomb and the application of organization to criminal activity. We had a major paramilitary threat to deal with over the years. And if it is suggested that this should not have in any way distracted from the fight against ordinary crime, if one wants to call it that, well, that is a spurious argument. If we had no paramilitary activity, yes, we would have crime. We would have organized crime. But I believe not on the scale that we have today. It brought down the value of human life in, in Irish society as we knew it. And sadly, that's happening with the drug gangs now. Uh, it, very difficult, they operate in a cell situation, the same as the provost operated. They don't tell many outside the cell what's going on because the stakes are very high. They're all fighting the same battle out there for supremacy in the supply of drugs. Organized crime in Ireland centers around criminal fraternities or criminal networks far more loosely structured than anything that was the case in the IRA.
However, these criminal connections that are required for drug trafficking, for money laundering and so on, seem to have piggybacked on the connections that were already in place because of paramilitary uh, organisations such as the IRA. And certainly the availability of guns and the know-how as to how to access these guns seems to have been passed down from paramilitary organisations to these looser criminal groups. In all, 17 arrests were made in Spain. Dubliner Christy Kinahan, said to be the boss, was arrested along with his two sons. The fact is that to our shame, we have created a mafia that's the equal of any mafia anywhere in Europe, and we have created an, an international criminal problem of a high order, and that is the legacy. Some are still living with the toll of that bitter legacy. In 1970, when Garda Richard Fallon was murdered by Sierra, few could have imagined the scale of the grief that was to come in the years ahead. My father's death was the breaking of the taboo of murder uh, in Ireland, in that from then on, life became not too high a price to pay uh, in violence and in crime in this country, and I, I don't think it's ever gone down since. In fact, it's exponentially increased ever since. The gun was here to stay. But it was narcotics that would propel organized crime into the big time. The duns would bring it in by the kilo. The profits that were to be made, they simply could not resist. Some of it, frankly, was quite unbelievable. Their old associate, John Gilligan, would bring it in by the ton. The Gilligan gang brought drug trafficking in this country to another level. They bought an almost business-like structure to their empire. The spoils were so good, a new wave of gangsters would emerge. Some of them think that they have a degree of respect, but the reality of it is, none of these gangs last longer than three to four years. With so much to gain, all this would lead to war.